Recorded live. Okay. Hi, everybody. We finally made it. We finally got David on the call. And hi, David. How are you this evening? Good. Thank you. Yeah, great. I'm glad you, you finally made it on. <laughs> I was going crazy trying to get you into this call. I don't know. I get confused with the, between the Skype and the talk shoe. Um, let me uh, just tell everyone if you want to ask David a question or if you want to speak, just uh, press star 8, and I'll uh, unmute you. But go ahead, David. We're all excited about your document. And right, Ranger Ron was telling us about your dead. What's dead? You didn't uh, get my email? Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I can't put myself on mute because that will put you on mute too, won't it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got the email. I saw the document. But for those that didn't, why don't you go into it a little bit? Into the document or into uh What exactly? Yeah, what did you do? Recognition that uh, the all-capital name David Clarence was deceased. How did you accomplish that? Well, let, let's start uh, kind of like that at the beginning. And uh, I'll get around to this a little bit. Okay. Roundabout sort of the way. And uh, Capri, if you'd stop uh, Skyping me, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. <laughs> He's Skyping me on here. Uh, I'm. <clears throat> this is David Clarence. Uh, Especially reserving all liberties. I am uh, one of the original county notaries uh, at York on the, on the land in the nation of Pennsylvania, uh, next to the barfly infested uh, county of York Corporation. And uh, you can contact me by emailing me at uh, County Notary, all one word, C-O-U-N-T-Y, N-O-T-A-R-Y, at Gmail. That's uh, Godmail, and our God is Almighty Yahweh, gmail.com. Please excuse that plug. <laughs> well, I'll stick it in there, Ange. Uh, the... Uh, Back in, uh, I, I've been doing this research for you folks that don't know anything about me. I've been a researcher and uh, litigator and uh, historian uh, of sorts uh, uh, for going on, um, gosh, now it's over 38 years. Now it started on 39, or it will shortly on the 17th. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but one day... Uh, my quest began September the 17th uh, uh, because of prison doors slamming behind me <laughs> a long time ago uh, for a crime that uh, I hadn't committed uh, involving um, uh, some construction work uh, uh, here in, on Pennsylvania. And uh, the quest was to figure out how that could happen, how, how you could be convicted in a court of justice uh, for a crime that you not only didn't commit, but it never took place. In 1994, uh, after many, many, what, 20-some years of uh, uh, litigating in the Barfly courts, uh, becoming pretty proficient at doing that and, and such things, I... Uh, was introduced to common law and uh, had come to the realization, and most of you folks won't agree with me, and that's fine, that there are no constitutions, that uh, lawful government ended with the uh, Continental Congress uh, retiring and uh, government that I had been uh, raised under and Educated under 
which uh, was all fraud. 1994, I lost a family farm, and uh, I was uh, sitting on the back steps of back stoop of the farmhouse uh, about six, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, knowing that they were coming next morning to uh, evict mom and I off of the land, contemplating whether I was going to uh, send mom to stay with relatives and go to war with these people and shoot it out or or what to do, and uh, frankly, bawling like a baby and uh, feeling pretty hopeless. And I, I'm sure a lot of you have felt this way, losing your homes and freedoms and things like that, and your families being split up and children taken away. And so I have uh, uh, a sense of uh, what some of you are going through. But um, I started praying. And I made a uh, an accord with uh, God that uh, if He would give me the the knowledge and discernment to understand what was going on with this system I was uh, battling, uh, trying to, f- to find justice, um, that I would serve Him and and. Uh, so that's kind of where the quest began uh, to figure this system out and what it's uh, made of and and how it functions and how it does what it does to us uh, as people and 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 we just have no clue as to what it is and how it's operating and and. Uh, 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 all the intricacies involved, and it's just a lot of mystery, and a lot of quest- questions and unanswered questions. Um, so, uh, lost the farm and uh, kind of started on this quest. But a uh, short time after that, uh, uh, Actually, a short time before that, I had actually started reading uh, the Bible uh, in depth, uh, something I hadn't really done. I I read bits and parts of it, but but hadn't really sat down and tried to read the entire document. And and, uh, before I had actually read the Bible from cover to cover, and I've done that uh, more than several times now, I had read Black's Law Dictionary from cover to cover several, several times, <laughs> and I'm kind of ashamed to say that, but in having a, a, a thorough understanding of man's codes, rules, and regulations, when I finally got around to reading uh, through the Bible, I had, a, I think, a, a, a better perspective on what it was saying and things like that. And, and I'm and I'm telling you folks this, and I know you don't. Some of you don't really want to hear it, but I want to give you some foundation and how you might repeat what I was able to do. Uh, I had first learned the, the maxims and principles of man's law, uh, and the maxims and principles of man's law are all based on scripture. See, and that's what I'm really talking about, having a, an understanding. So, fast forward uh, to, uh, hmm, let's see, 2005. Uh, I'd been working with some men here locally, and they had various uh, uh, experiences and getting into mischief and traffic citations and and different things and local taxes and one of them uh Glenn Allen had uh a history when I met him. He had already been uh struggling with the IRS excuse me for a moment. 
for about uh, three years, something like that, uh, trying to avoid the tax. In uh, uh, I'm kind of a magnet. I have been for a long, long time uh, for people to, to contact once they've uh, ran the gambit of the barfly court system or whatever it is, and they can't find a remedy anywhere else, and you finally end up at my doorstep. But um, in either case, um, I was I had been listening to Rice McLeod's uh, broadcast for many years and talking to uh, Rice on, uh, privately on telephone and things like that. And uh, one thing that intrigued me the talked about was that the uh, notary was the highest office in law. And uh, so I did started researching that uh, subject and, and found out it, it exactly uh, he was exactly right. Uh, it is. Uh, it Without the office of scribe or the, uh, the recorder uh, subscribing the, the oath of office, None of these uh, so-called uh, government offices can exist. And if you have a notarized document, uh, no court uh, in the world system, even if it's notarized by a notary public, can uh, refuse to... Uh, allow you to enter that document into uh, evidence and and once uh, entered uh, it cannot be questioned or challenged the authenticity of the document now you can challenge the contents of the document but not the fact that it's uh, properly notarized if in fact it is um, but uh, we there and begin our our quest to unravel um, even further uh, what what the Sparfly court system was in the government and it, if in fact it's it wasn't constitutionally based or authorized and and it's not uh, what it is <laughs> and how it's operating and and what's uh, what's behind it. And um, I've followed many paths, and and I'm sorry to take up your time to to go through this uh, background, but I I would like to explain something, this to you. Uh, I went through, uh, experienced uh, what I call a lawman, uh, I being uh, one, a litigator, a pro se, or a litigant. I was involved in with constitutionalists and uh, and lawmen like right way law uh, people and followed their materials and this and that and they evidently turned out to be the wrong way they all ended up in prison um, I actually knew one of the uh, Montana Freeman uh, and his girlfriend they had been here uh, at um, a York before they got involved in that uh, siege out there in uh, Montana uh, to do a broadcast on a local uh, Christian uh, satellite net- TV network uh, here just south of me, a red line about uh, six, eight miles. And um, they were introduced to me by the host who I'd known for years before that, the uh, Reverend uh, James Nichols. It was actually my mentor, common law, and uh, so I experienced uh, a lot of things. I I know uh, Hartford Van Dyke, uh, Hartford and I had hooked up, gotten together back in 1993, and uh, he was my mentor, and uh, a lot of these uh, commerce people regard him as... uh, uh, quite a knowledgeable man, which he is, and one of the original um, uh, 
commerce, so-called commerce gurus, I call them gurus, and, <laughs> uh, and they are uh, knowledgeable people. Uh, and uh, so I've had experiences with uh, all the different types of procedures that all you folks are involved in or may get involved in or have been involved in looking for a remedy. So uh, when it comes to commerce um, and commerce activities, I've, I've been uh, railing against that for uh, many years because I understand what it is and, and what's really going on. And it, it's not that and, and I'm not saying this, I'm not even suggest that that the people in, in that I call the gurus, you know, the leaders, I won't really rather not name them, but you know who they are. Uh I'm not saying they're bad people or or shysters or anything like that. It's it's that they really just don't understand uh what what's going on and, and the type of uh contractual uh perspective that they try to apply to what government is doing uh, or the courts are doing and, and it's all really the bar associations doing and they're running everything uh, it's not normal contract law say folks um, they, they have this um, uh, bible uh, that they call the commercial code uniform commercial code but if you get get involved in their activities long enough, you soon figure out that uh, they're not operating by by even those rules. See, uh, they they appear to have no real rules. <laughs> Isn't that odd? Uh, that they they have all these uh, 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 ethics and things like that that they publishing their books that they're to follow and, and they're supposed to be so forthright and, and upright and honest and all of this and, and they're just not. <laughs> and you soon figure that out if you get involved with them. And uh how can that be? You know, it just it just doesn't make sense. But uh these uh pro se litigant uh procedures of uh just um, copying what the what the lawyers do. I call the bar flies, uh, mimicking them. Uh, they don't work in their courts. Say uh, sometimes they'll let a litigant win, and, and I have had experiences of that. But it's 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 a hard row to, to hoe, you know. And uh, it, it's uh, seems like to be a good boy old boys club, you know, a girl boys club, and, and it is, <laughs> if you're not a bar member, uh, even though it's not supposed to be that way. You, you can read the Constitution and, and laws uh, regarding uh, due process of law in uh, uh, court, uh, and, and they're supposed to give uh, a pro se litigants uh, a lot of lead way and uh, uh, a lot of respect, you know, and, and uh, consideration of their of their arguments and their position and things like that. But they just don't do that. <laughs> the reality is they don't do it. So uh, if you try to apply these uh, those procedures, they're hard, uh, difficult to use uh, to find a remedy. Uh, if you try to argue the Constitution, uh, uh, they'll tell you the Constitution doesn't apply there. Uh, that that's where I was in 1994. See, I, I had figured out why the Constitution doesn't apply there, even though there's an official sitting there on that bench who took an oath to it, telling me it doesn't apply in that courtroom. How could that be? In reality is there isn't one. There's nothing after the Northwest Ordinance, see, or very little. Uh, the real constitution is the Articles of Confederation. But in either case, um, continue here. Um, 
I, I got to give these commerce people uh, credit for their their diligence and their research and their tenacity uh, of of sticking to this uh, uh, quest uh, to find a remedy. And, and and I won't take that away from them. Uh, it, they're fine researchers. Uh, and and that I can name them. Uh, I don't know them all. If I leave some out, then I apologize. Uh, Hartford Van Dyke, uh, Winston Stroud, uh, Jack Smith. Uh, you know, uh, and and I certainly don't want to leave, leave out uh, uh, Elvick, say Walter Elvick. Uh, but their concepts and and how to deal. Uh, uh, with this uh with this system it is just uh defective it it it's just a, they have an erroneous perspective of what they're dealing with i was just listening to dave max uh broadcast uh earlier this week today uh and they're talking about this this new uh process procedure they're going to use and they're going to implement and, and this and that and I'm I'm sitting here and I'm shaking my head and kind of chuckling because uh, I already know it's not going to work it's going to fail uh, be, because of the perspective that they have um, and not, it's not that they're stupid or they're wrong or or intentionally wrong or anything like that it's just that the perspective of what they're dealing with is defective uh, erroneous and if you don't understand what it is you're dealing with then all your ideas and, and efforts and things to deal with whatever that subject is is defective see and and probably going to fail it, it, it's not that, that it's uh, uh, anything intentional it's just the way it is. You understand? So, fast forward uh, to uh, my meeting, Regan Wayne, uh, Dwayne Reedy from Christiansburg, Virginia. Uh, let's see, that was uh, 2007. And uh, Regan and I uh, hooking up uh, following the notaries. Uh, Re Regan came from kind of pretty much a commerce background and had uh, a lot of involvement with um, commerce activities and things like that. And and so did uh, his associates that he brought along with him. And I ref low, uh, affectionately refer to them as the hillbilly notaries. And uh, uh, they were trying to introduce me to uh, or get me to see their commerce side of looking at things. And, and I was continually rejecting that and different things. But some of the concepts that, uh, that they tried to uh, instill in me uh, kind of stuck a little bit. And at the same time that they're trying to uh, kind of bring me over to a commerce perspective of things, I'm trying to get them to look at things from a law perspective, say. And that the law that I was trying, uh, that, that actually I use uh, and have since 1994, is trust law. And that's really what the notary office is based on, is trust law or state law. Uh, trust law is the highest law there is. That's why the notary office is the highest office in that law, is because that's the law or the office by which the common law or trust law is animated, say, uh, Officiated, uh, it creates documents for that type of, uh, of law. And, uh, oh shoot, cotton pickers would quit Skyping me or interrupting my 
train of thought and I only have one brain cell to work with here. Just don't look <laughs> don't look at the Skype board. <laughs> well I say do you hear that thing? Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah, I can hear it. Can you hear it? Sure. Or am I the only one that hears it in my headset? But uh somebody here on the chat board is going, uh <laughs> The dude ever going to tell us about the damn trust? Ladybug's the last one I just did. Oh. <laughs> Jackie, well, she's on here too. She's on this yeah. chat too. But uh, let's let's get to the point. But, um, <laughs> folks, uh, there's so many types of variations of law in the world system, um, and and if you look at <laughs> at these huge libraries that these law schools have and uh, uh, like the state law library up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, just enormous amount of volumes and words and things like that. And if you folks haven't had an opportunity to walk the aisles of one of those buildings and look at all those books and books and books and books, you need to do that. Just just to walk through. You don't really have to take any book out, books out of the shelves and open them up and read them or anything. But just walk through there and get a, a personal uh, perspective of exactly how many written words are involved in what I'm about to say to you. And you should do that with a copy of the King James Bible in your hand. And after you get done walking back and through all those aisles, floor after floor, looking at all those books and and uh, think about how many millions and or hundreds of millions of words are in those cotton-picking things, do you know what they're trying to accomplish? They're trying to uh, replace or outdo uh, one book, and that's the one you got in your hand. That that's man's effort to duplicate on the flip side in the world systems uh, uh, operation. How to replace that one book you got in your hand? And sometimes it comes down to where all those voluminous uh, publicationers are trying to replace two stone tablets. And they'll never accomplish it. It's all an illusion. All those books that you you walk by and look at them, it's all about an illusion. It doesn't really exist. It's all false. And... and if you take that and you can put it into perspective, and maybe you'll understand what I'm about to explain to you. When we come into this world, in the deliberate room, or maybe in on the way to the hospital, uh, or 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 whatever, eventually. Somebody's going to take your little feet and ink them up and press them onto a paper document and apply your little footprints there. Those are your landmarks. Same as a landmark of your of your uh, land or your property. Of your homestead, say. People, you can hear them uh, talk about various landmarks, <laughs> but you never hear them refer to your footprints that you can take your shoes and socks off and walk on the land and leave behind as your landmarks. The world system will never refer to that, say. And those footprints, they only want it, want those one time in your life. It's 
when you're born. They call it a birth. They spell it B-I-R-T-H. Is it B-I-R-T-H or is it B-E-R-T-H? As in birthing a vessel. That's an interesting question. But they'll never ask you for those landmarks again in your lifetime. You can be a double amputee and be arrested for something. And the uh, arresting officials or the jailers are not going to take your shoes and socks off and take your footprints. There are no FBI footprint cards. They don't exist. If you're a double amputee and have no hands, they will just write on the form amputee. See? So they'll submit blank fingerprint cards, but they will not take your footprints to verify who you are or create a, a, one of their print records. Why not? I don't know exactly. Uh, but they they won't do it. And the fact that they won't, and, and you can be identified by those footprints, they're just as unique mm-hmm. as your fingerprints are. That's... Uh, something that gets my attention when I come across an oddity like that in how the world operates and does things. And and the reason why it gets my attention is because I have learned uh, over the years that uh, an oddity uh, involving the world is uh, a remedy or uh, some very important knowledge or discernment uh, to our advantage versus the world system, say. It's oddities that I see how the world operates that really draws my attention. But uh, we're programmed and educated in a certain way, folks. Uh, No matter how much of a free thinker you think you are, the fact of the matter is, none of us are in relation to how we've been indoctrinated to this world system and how to think about it and how to regard it and how to function in it uh, in our daily lives. And it's uh, on a uh, subconscious level how we react to certain things like police officer, you know, asking for identification uh, or uh, uh, notice in the mail that uh, this government entity wants its tribute, its taxes, say, or uh, one of their officials uh, visiting your home and you're just changing uh, rain spouting or something like that and demanding to know why you didn't get a permit, permission from the government to do that. You know, we were programmed to react to them in a certain way, and we do it automatically without thinking. We regard them as authorities, see, and they, re- and they represent an authority. And if you look at the the world system, uh, they they build these grandiose buildings out of granite and marble and and things like that, and they make them look uh, so authoritative. You know, uh, they're the halls of government and the halls of justice. Say uh, these uh, institutions, <laughs> and they are. Because they're populated with mental patients, they're all insane, you see. Because they're not halls of of uh, uh, higher learning, really. They're halls of higher uh, level of delusion, and, and they're certainly not halls of justice, as you'll soon find out if you've had any uh, experiences in them. Uh, but but they make them uh, so grand and. Uh, it's because of the imaging that surely 
whatever is contained in there must be the authority, see. Uh, and, and you can't be because uh, you just have a, a lowly little homestead, see. And look at the comparison of the two, see. Uh, but in fact, uh, the reality is that uh, there are the interlopers and you are the government and you always have been. And it's uh, for no other reason than you can put your cotton-picking prints on the land and leave your landmarks behind and all of these worldly entities cannot because they merely exist on a piece of paper that has no landmarks. It's just ink and type and letters. Say, and the reason for that is because we are uh, born and then uh, birthed <laughs> into this world system uh, with an estate that we are in possession of automatically. And those landmarks in that document are proof of that estate. And it's an E state, say, E hyphen state. And I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit why I'm emphasizing that. And that estate comes from your creator, whether you like it or not. You don't have to like it, but it's there. And he's given it to each and every one of us. It's a uh, birthright, born right, say. Uh, the estate is set up for you in Scripture. And Scripture is all trust law. Trust law, if, if you don't get anything else from what I'm going to tell you tonight, I would like you to grasp and understand this. Trust law is the highest law there is. It absolutely trumps every other form of man's law be it equity, commerce, uh, treaties, <laughs> which are laws of nations. doesn't matter. Trust law trumps them all. When you're operating in trust law, none of those other various forms of codes, rules, and regulations, and commerce can touch you. You're automatically immune from all other forms of law. When you're operating in trust law, you're in the superior law. There is none higher. And all of these barfly judges especially, and I believe most of the lawyers know that. They really do. In our experiences with this estate letter that we published to you folks to to utilize, and I'll cover that here tonight. Our experiences with that letter is it's automatically given to the lawyer, and the responses back that we get from the letter is not written by some lowly government uh, agent or clerk or somebody like that. It's written by the lawyer. What lawyer? Usually a solicitor. Okay. Okay. But, um... Is that what you did? Yeah, that's what we've been doing. Mm-hmm. So, but... I'm not, I haven't used it personally, because I'm not the one running around out here getting myself in mischief all the time. Okay, okay but that the title of that letter says, uh, it's your Treasury Direct account. From the Office of Executor. For the estate, estate. Okay. Right? So how did you get that? What was? How did we come up with that? Yeah. Well, I'll get to that. How we come to understand it? Okay. For for many years, folks, I've looked at 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 uh, uh, legal uh, concepts and and things like like that from a position of the office, see, and not the individual occupying it. 
because I've recognized it's the office, it's the office, it's the office. It's not the temporary occupant of the office. It's the office that has the authority, if there has any at all. It's the office with the authority. The office of sheriff, say the office of mayor, uh, a police officer office, not the occupant standing there with the badge and uniform. It's the office, the individuals, whomever they are, public, public hmm. servants or oh. politicians, or just temporary occupants of the office, the office indoors, see? That's the, what I'm, what I'm trying to get through to you is the, the office of God, the office of Lord, the office of angel, the office of man, and the office of womb, man, endure forever. David. Yes. Do you have a di Treasury Direct account? No. Okay. But the name does. Okay. The name has a Treasury Direct account. And how does one go about doing that? And when one gets that, do they have access to it? Can they pay their bills with it? What is the purpose of it? Uh, you're trying to jump me ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay. I'll be patient. All right. Okay. Um, the estate is everything, folks, and and that Treasury Direct uh, uh, acknowledgement that the name received is uh, is part of the estate. You have an estate. If you understand state law, state law is trust law, the highest law there is. The highest office and trust law is the executor or executrix office. It trumps every other office, including trustees. Executors appoint trustees. Trustees do not appoint executors. Grantors appoint executors, normally in a will. See, and then the executor may create trustees to manage an estate or a trust that continues on for a period of time or in perpetuity. Those offices that you see in government constitutions are all trust offices. The foundation of Constitutions, Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, United States, and all those corporate state constitutions are trust law. Every one of them has to take an oath. Uh, I don't know how it is in all of the corporate states. Uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania oath that they, every official has to take down to the township from the offices of the Commonwealth down through the counties and the towns, cities, and villages, and so on and so forth, boroughs, they have to take the oath to the Pennsylvania and the United States Constitution, and that oath ends with the word fidelity. Fidelity means fiduciary. And it only applies in a trust relationship. So there's an estate there. See? Those folks are just to be managers over the estate. And as such, they have some very particular responsibilities and codes of ethics and things like that that they have to follow. And if they don't do that, then they're misfeasant and malfeasance in, in trust law. And for a trustee to violate the trust is the most heinous crime that one can commit. It's above murder in, in the eyes of law 
and even the barfly coach rules and regulations. It's it's uh, that's what treason is. That's why treason uh, uh, calls for uh, a death penalty. It's the same thing when a trustee violates the trust and their fiduciary duties. So, go back and reread the state and U.S. constitutions. And every time you see the word state in those documents, stop and look at what you're reading and think about it and ask yourself, is that state being discussed there? The state of Arizona, the state of Maryland, um, or is it an east state? And a, a state, because I want to give you a little clue. Oftentimes in there, they're talking about an estate, an E S T A T E, not just S T A T E. Go into Title Twenty Eight, United States Code, Judiciary, uh, Federal Civil Judicial Procedure and Rules, and read. Uh, the section on sovereign immunity involving foreign states, 1600 uh, series section, or 13, maybe 1300, I'm sorry. That Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is being described in there as talking about an estate as immune. It speaks of foreign states. It's an estate, e-state. It's a deceptive word, twisting by the lawyers. They're very good at this. Now I'll get down to the meat of tonight's subject, finally, and address uh, Angela's questions and issues. After we're born... Mom, dad takes us home. Shortly after that, you receive your first piece of mail. That's an envelope from the state government with a copy of a certificate of birth in it. It's addressed to you. At least it appears to be. But it's in all the names in all capital letters. That is the government notifying you that in a state where your benefit and your protection has been created. And that certificate of birth, and you folks that I had messaged uh, about this broadcast tonight, I asked you to have a certificate, your certificate of birth in front of you tonight the driver's license, and social security card. So we, I could cover those subjects. If you take that document and look at it, it appears to have your name in it, on it in all capitalized letters. That all capitalized name, and I'll refer to it as the name. I call it the name. It's the name. Whenever I see it, it's not me. Is the name of the estate. And you know who that document is mailed to? The occupant of the office of the executor or executrix, the highest official over that estate or state. If you look at that certificate of birth carefully, you're going to see a seal and a signature on there. The seal has the office of registrar on it. I've seen dozen, dozen and a half various corporate state birth certificates or certificates of birth, including Washington, D.C. Every one of them have had a registrar seal on them. I'd, I'd be willing to bet that they all do. Uh, and this is why. If you look in Black's Law Dictionary for the 
definition of registrar, you won't find it. You won't find it in Valentine's, but you will find it in Bouvier's. And here's the definition. The registrar in Great Britain, just as in the United States, is the probate court. The registrar in Great Britain, just as in the United States, is the probate court. It doesn't say the probate judge. It says it's the court. What do probate courts do? They only serve one function. They probate estates, don't they? See? So that seal on there, and the government put it on there, and the occupant of that office signed it on a banknote safety paper document. It's a certification that that estate has been either probated or it's in probate. It's one or the other. See? And by transmitting that certificate to you, the living being, your physical location, they're acknowledging that you are the executor or executrix of that estate. And it has value, a lot of value, when you're just a few days old and actually milliseconds after that's filed and recorded, a very valuable estate is created. And soon after that, it gains value. It never stops the whole time you're living. And after your death, continues to increase in value. Value of what? Well, uh, actually, units uh, of value uh, that can be converted into various currencies. And uh, it, it's uh, literally the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you see. In fact, that's what most rainbows do. What's the Irish uh, saying? Uh, uh, I guess it's the Irish that... Uh, at the end of the rainbow is a pot of gold. Say, most rainbows end, uh, even though they probably can't zero in on on where they come in contact with the Earth. But uh, uh, if you could, I would venture to guess that at that point there is some man or woman there in close proximity to it, and there the estate the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. So, the government is, uh, they, they take that birth registration and through their actuaries, they calculate out uh, how much revenue the government will collect from you in a lifetime. Now, some of us will be less and some of us will be more. Uh, most of us lead rather normal lives and we just have a normal day-to-day -day job. And I don't say just, but that's what we do. And, uh, um, you know, uh, a normal home and uh, an automobile or two, maybe a boat or a camper or something like that. Uh, and, and, and don't really attend colleges and universities things like that and, and we raise a family and go on our normal lives others uh, attend colleges universities and uh, uh, may earn a little bit more uh, each year acquire more things <laughs> uh, and uh, others get into business and, and different things and earn even more and uh, uh, the, the the issue and all that is how many documents you're going to sign in your lifetime that are going to be put into the world system. Um, 
through uh, banking, uh, finance, uh, registration of property and land and uh, vehicles and uh, and such things, and forming corporations, signing uh, financial instruments uh, involving banks and uh, bank accounts, things like that. Uh, credit cards you're going to use and uh, transactions you're going to make on all those accounts, uh, be it a, a physical uh, paper document or electronic uh, uh, transaction, it matters not. Uh, it bears your signature of the executor to the estate, uh, uh, be it through a uh, 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 using a pen or, or typing it into a keypad uh, at a point of sale it, it, or in the internet, it matters not. It's the energy that you uh, create through that effort that funds the estate. The, the signature puts value on a document. The document is worthless until it bears your signature. The document has no value until the signature of the executor or executrix is affixed to the document. I noticed that the document that you sent us, it says that you're, you, you how did you kill the the name. <laughs> you keep trying to go back to that. Well, I, you know, that's what I want to know, how you did that. What is the purpose and what good does it do? I'm sorry. Am I blowing your line of rap, David? Are, are you what? I said, am I blowing your line of rap? Are, are you what, dear? Am I blowing your line of rap? Am I blowing it for you, David? I don't mean to be... No, you're just jump, jumping me ahead. Oh, you know, okay. I, I don't often. T I don't get the opportunity very often to to uh, blab. Uh, and uh, well, you sent me this intriguing document, right? I sent you um, what? That intriguing document that says Treasury Direct Account. Mm. And, yeah, and that David Clarence is deceased. And yet it's still, the name is deceased, and yet he's still the, he's the executor. How can that be? Yeah, well. <clears throat> There's no upper and lower case name for the executor there. You're just the executor. Oh, the all name, all capitalized name of state. Okay. How'd you get that? So. How'd you do it? By how'd, do it? how'd you get that thing? I we applied for it. Know. What'd you do? Do you have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar account or what? I thought you had to lie. I have like uh two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to have one of those accounts. <laughs> well, uh, the estate can acquire that account. Okay. Without depositing anything. It's already set up there I for that for the estate to be able to do that. From the time you put your little landmark on that piece of paper. Right? Bingo. Well, uh, from the time they, they create the files, there's a file number and a file date on that birth uh, certificate of birth. That's the date that that estate was created. It's not the date you're born. It's the file date. Okay. And the address of that estate is that file number on the certificate of birth. Okay. It's not the address that they mailed it to is the executor or executrix address, but the estate address is the file number. That's where the estate always exists. In the file number? Yes. Okay, so what led you to, how did you, leave on, don't, don't, give us the good stuff. Give us the beef of this whole thing. <laughs> Somebody said that on the chat. Batman said, where's the beef? Where's the beef? 
<laughs> met this character last November upon my return from that 90-day abduction uh, in Club Fed. Uh, I call him the schmuck guy. He uh, He's a former banker and level six stock trader. And he understands this commerce stuff like nobody else I've ever met. He's just... Uh, hand and fist over all these gum commerce gurus. Uh, and between the, him applying uh, all these schmuck guy stuff and uh, uh, intermixing that or uh, throwing it up against the dumb Dutchman uh, logic, uh, we've managed to figure out a lot of things that have been given to us by Almighty Yahweh, and we've been led to uh, these past months. Literally spent thousands and thousands of hours on the phone and uh, sending thousands of emails back and forth and things, uh, working our way through this quest. And the quest is to obey the commandment. It's in uh, Ezekiel and uh, Revelations to come out of her and be separate from her. And her is the world system. And uh, part of uh, it's not uh, predominant to us anyway, uh, but part of that uh, quest to come out of her uh, is to raid Egypt on the way out, the same as the Israelites did. And uh, that was our uh, our goal. Uh, however, uh, Yahweh has given us the discernment to understand that uh, it's not necessary to raid it because the estate is already there. It's already funded. And it's operating in this in a law form that's superior to every other uh, type of uh, various uh, man-created laws, codes, rules, and regulations, such things, commerce. Do we write the treasury or something? And uh, what? How do we get um, one? Yeah, you could. I want to know, how did you get the damn account going? How do we do okay. that? How do we get the Treasury Direct accounts? Just apply for it. And do you have to have, okay, so, but when they say you have to have $250,000 to put into that account, what, are you just telling them, you know, take it out of my estate or what? I mean. <laughs> no. They'll open the account for the estate. They have to. Okay. How do you because, do that? Because everything that's backing up, all the uh, financial dealings of the United States are these estates. You know, after uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, about a month or so after that, I, I remember this vividly. It was one of these oddities that caught my attention and st st stuck in my memory. President Johnson... Uh, Got off Air Force One on uh, tarmac. I think it was Andrews Air Force Base. I'm not sure. Uh, they had a podium set up there for a little photo op, and uh, he made an announcement that the uh, uh, they were changing the currency and uh, abandoning the, the silver certificates, and uh, the Federal Reserve was going to issue a currency. And uh, a reporter asked him, and I, I suspect it was probably staged, but in either case, a reporter asked him, Mr. President, what's going to back up uh, the new currency? What's, what's going to guarantee the new currency? And he said these words, the new currency will be backed by American industry. 
Well, that's nothing new. Uh, no, not now to to us because of the efforts of the commerce people. We've come to, come to understand that uh, it's probably speaking of the Social Security accounts or the estates. Uh, and, in fact, that's what he was talking about. He didn't mean that GM or Ford or uh, Boeing was... Uh, AT&T was backing new currency. It was you and I with our signatures on documents. Uh, whether we know it or not, functioning in the office of executor or executrix for the estates, creating uh, the credit, the energy uh, that the United States is the debt toward too. Uh, all debts are of the United States. Say they they tell us tell us that. Right. So who is the United States indebted to? Well, they mislead us into believing it's the Federal Reserve, and it's not. It's to the estates of each of us individually. They the owe it big time. Account. Yeah. See, I they, agree. Those foreign states described in Title Twenty Eight with the sovereign immunity. See, the creditor has uh, immunity from the debtor. The debtor can bring no claim against the creditor hmm. as long as there is a debt. It's a slave-master relationship. See, now a, cre a creditor could injure a debtor and, and be sued and be liable for it. I'm not saying it can't, but... Uh, as long as uh, the provisions of the contractual relationship are followed, the uh, debtor can have no claim against the creditor. So, so, but day in and day out, we're fraught with these claims uh, or the appearance of these claims from the government and uh, banking industry and so on and so forth. Uh, but they're all just illusions that the debts have all been already all been paid. See, and and the office of uh, the estate is the creditor. <laughs> this is how they trick us, folks. It's so simple. It's 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 just ridiculous. So what did you do, David? You wrote a letter. Capitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know. And they sent and they send it to you. And they deliberately leave, leave one or two words, one or one of two words off the back of that all capitalized name. And they do this on purpose. And the, the they that's doing this are the damn lawyers, the bar flies. Mm -hmm. And the words that they leave off the back of that all capitalized name is either the word estate or the word executor. I see. Every every time you get mail from a government or financial agency or something that is something other than private personal correspondence, and they have your name in upper and lower case, they're writing to the executor, the the occupant of the executor office. So if you respond back to them as the executor, that will trigger the correct response from them back, I mean, to address you as the e-state executor? Yes. It's not something they're going to automatically do. Proof of that is everything they've all ever sent you, no matter what it is. Never has the word executor or executrix. If you put it there, and only you can do that, now you change the relationship of whatever entity that you're dealing with. And I'm not talking about personal correspondence. I'm talking about with government, uh, banks, uh, tax collection agencies, whether it's the IRS or local or, or, or whatever, financial institutions. You now change the relationship to where you're notifying them with just those one of two words, estate or executor or executrix, mm -hmm. that you're the creditor and they're the debtor. 
And until you do that, they won't treat you as such. Throughout our lives, they're raiding your estate and actually uh, populating it with uh, um, units, increasing the worth of the estate in doing it. But there, are, for many years, we've we've realized that these poor flies in the black dresses are administering something from the bench, and and what they're administering is the estate. Yeah. And the reason they're doing that is because they're they're interacting with the executor or executrix of the estate that doesn't know that they are. And it's not their duty to tell us that we are. They have no duty to tell us that. They may have a moral duty, but they don't operate on the moral duties. Since we're not uh, cognizant of our true capacity and role and are not functioning in the office, they treat us as a trustee who's in violation of the of their trustee duties and they penalize you for doing that. They jail you or imprison you or fine you, take your home, take your children, your your, your wife, your if you're the husband, and women aren't gonna like this, but the wife in taking the name of the husband puts her estate under his estate. And all of the proceeds from that joiner, joining of those estates are under the husband's estate. Now she's, a, she's a co-executor or executrix in a relationship. But the children cannot be taken <laughs> by children and youth if you function in the office of executor fathers <laughs> they can't do that because those children are trust property they're assets of the trust and if you don't believe it get the long form birth certificate and look who's listed on there oh it's your mother your father your the mother and father the estates of the parents are listed, not the mother and father. The all caps name estates are listed under on there. That that child, that estate that's been just been created, is underneath the master estate of the father and the mother, who are under the master estates of their mother and father. Who are under their master estates of the grandmother and grand the grandfather and the grandmother? So what did you do, David? Master estates of the great grandfather and the great grandmother, and it goes all the way back to the master estate of Adam and Eve. So you sat down one day and just decided you were going to write this letter to the uh, treasury, or yeah, what? you just dropped off. You, it ended with I sat down one day. No. No, I didn't do that. Um, th th this quest uh, uh, to come out of her, uh, uh, like I said, began with uh, uh, Timothy and I meeting. And uh, he was uh, intrigued by our concept of the office of man and woman. That's what drew him to to us. Um, he, he has a scriptural uh, foundation, and, uh, and and I know most of you folks aren't really interested in this part. And you where is the mate? But uh, as we've already told you on our previously on our notary uh, broadcasts on talk show, um, and the archives are still available. And if you folks don't know where they are, send me an email and. Uh, and I'll send you a response, and in that response uh, will be a link to archives.org where our previous uh, talk show broadcasts are located, or they're on the RSS feed. 
if you just type in a voice of freedom or county notary on uh, uh, iTunes uh, or RSS feed, they'll come up. Um, the foundation of, of all this is already in there. We, we've already given you, uh, as a result of my being involved with the hillbilly notaries, uh, they, they kept coming up with this concept of getting a DOT number. Uh, as a way to be able to travel on the highways and not be molested by the the revenueers out there. And uh, initially I wasn't interested in it and rejected the idea and this and that and until they brought it up the third time. When something is brought to my attention three times, it gets my attention. Uh, I, st- I stop and say, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Some, maybe something I should be looking at. But uh, in either case, uh, I went on the DOT um, website and uh, obtained a, a DOT number. And uh, using the Dutchman logic, uh, uh, everyone else had a private uh, motor carrier designation on there. Destry, please stop that. You're you're interrupting me here. It's blasting in my ears. But uh, I would. I was able to obtain a registrant status, and I won't go into how I did that. It's already in our file section in Google Groups and uh, in our previous archives and on and on Angela's broadcast previously. Uh, but that led to um, obtaining a registrant status, and and then uh, that led to uh, our being able to obtain law enforcement. Uh, access on the Department of Transportation website uh, by having a what I refer to as the master number to enter in as the badge number on the DOT. Uh, what is the master number? Uh, uh, we don't really know. It, it appears to be a number like a Swiss bank account number. It's uh, If you have a secret Swiss bank account, uh, you, you don't give your name to access that account. You just give the number. You, do, you don't. You, the number having the number is your identification to be able to access the account. They're, they're not looking for a photograph or a picture ID or anything like that to access that. And, and it could be billions of dollars in the account. It doesn't matter um, having the number. Is your identification and your authority to access the account. Well, the master number appears to be uh, something similar to that or on the same plane. Um, and we, we believe that it's the master account for the estate that was created, you know, a capitalized name. Uh, in either case, we've been... Uh, uh, since we were able to accomplish that, we've been experimenting with that and uh, attempting to access the funds, uh, resources, financial resources, and involved with that ever since. And no, we haven't been successful yet. Um, uh, or I'd be speaking to Angela from Northwest Montana tonight and, and not uh, South Central uh, Pennsylvania. But the name, uh, the all caps name, David Clarence Schroll, uh, was able to um, obtain uh, uh, access to uh, uh, resources on the DOT website that normally don't appear there for you when you just go on there surfing the web. Um, then the all capitalized name was uh, able to obtain an EIN number for the name. Uh, that EIN number starts with a 98, uh, thereby uh, designating that entity, the all capitalized name, as a foreign entity. And your estate is always foreign to the United States and its states. That's why it's immune under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Say. That's an acknowledgement that the estate is immune because the estate is the creditor, say. Then uh, 
uh, that 98 uh, EIN number is uh, acknowledgement from the IRS that the name has no uh, reporting or, or payment tax liabilities to the United States or its states. If you're immune from taxation by the IRS, then you're immune from the state and the local revenues also. Okay, so does that uh, position you now have with that Treasury Direct account make you uh, invisible to them? No. The, you cannot destroy the name. The estate, you cannot destroy. You you will not do that. Uh, these efforts by these uh, folks to get rid of it, to have it erased, to remove it from all records expunged, you will never accomplish that, ever. There's no way to do that. Not in the world system. The best you can do, and it's really the best position, is function in the office of executor or executrix for the name. And thereby doing that, you deny everybody else from having a presumption of authority to administer anything involving the estate. It is immunity. The bar flies sitting up there on the bench and the ones in their offices walking around with their briefcases and the bankers and the collection agents and the IRS and your local rev tax revenue revenuers and zoning officers and uh, children and youth officials cannot administer anything having to do with that estate any longer. They can't they, because they're just presuming to have the authority. They're just pretending to have the authority to do that. That's what they've been doing to us our whole lives, is they're presuming to have the authority to administer the estate when they have no letter of appointment from the executor or executrix office, see. And the letters that you see that we've given you as examples, and I hope none of you folks have used that yet, but because you need a little more background on how to use it properly, that letter is calling them to task. Where is your written authority to administer for the estate? Provide it. They know they can't. The they I'm talking about are the lawyers. They don't have the written authority. They haven't been appointed as a trustee. And they certainly can't occupy the office of executor or executrix because there's only one individual can do that, and that's you. Proof of that is, if mom and dad are, are dead, passed away, you're the only one that can go to the state and get a, a, an original certificate of birth. Or someone with your power of attorney, which is the executor's power of attorney, to do that. The authority must originate from the executor or executrix office to get an original certificate of birth. See, I don't know everything, and I don't, I don't have that much experience with uh, probate courts, family courts, and things like that, but I've never heard of a court ordering uh, the, the state to uh, issue a certificate of birth. I've just never heard of that. I think that that's a function of the executor or executrix's office that these bar flies uh, uh, won't presume to have authority to, to function and to do is order that. So. so have you used it yet? What? Your uh, executor position. I'm using it all the time. Yeah, dealing with the government. Dealing and with tre Treasury. Dealing with the DTC. Dealing with the Federal Reserve. And I'll get to that. <laughs> uh but if you folks are the ones with all the authority, all the all these other efforts, these patriot efforts, these uh, uh, tea parties, uh, 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 whatever it is, <laughs> it's all a waste of your time. It just is. It, it'll lead to nothing. You, you will not get a remedy in participating in those activities, and, and I'm not taking away from that. 
that uh, they're all well-meaning folks and, and well-intended and things like that. But you cannot function in those capacities because by operating in those capacities, pursuing those things, you're abandoning the estate and your executor or executrix office. Because why would you be petitioning? Why would you be demonstrating against the debtor when you're already in the creditor's position? See? If you have a representative in government, a legislator, where he considers you to be his constituent, he, he's not interacting with you as the executor or executrix of the estate. He's looking at you as the debtor when you're not. He is. And the office he occupies is your is the debtor to your estate. The name when I speak of the name, I'll capitalize David Clarence Roll obtained an end cage number from NATO, registered with NATO, as a foreign entity to NATO. If you look at this Treasury Direct acknowledgement, that it's addressed to the nation, Pennsylvania. Imagine that. Ain't the state, ain't the Commonwealth. It's the cotton-picking nation. General Post Office. United States Minor Outlying Islands. Did you know that you were located on an island on that nation state that you're standing on, on your landmarks? No, but I found that really interesting. You are. You are. The United States Minor Outlying Islands are not out there in the Pacific. Barflies tampered with that phrase, I believe, when they codified it and they dropped a comma out of it. I've thought this since probably around 1994, that the, it, sh, it properly written, it should see, say United States Minor, comma, Outlying Islands. By introducing the comma into that phrase, now you put it in its correct and proper perspective, that the United States, the District of Columbia, is minor, to the outlying nation islands. See? Treasury recognizes that. NATO recognizes that as a bona fide mailing location. They ask me on the Internet for the country. And one of the selections that they give me is United States Minor Outlying Islands. And when I have Nation Pennsylvania General Post Office and I put hyphen 9998 following the zip code for York, Pennsylvania, those entities recognize that as a foreign nation, the country. That's not my, that's not some patriot gobbledygook. It's there on the websites. You can select it. Not, not in everything you'll sign up for on the internet, but it involving government it will, or banking. Now, the name, David Clarence Schroll, registered with the, foreign, the Federal Reserve a couple of weeks ago, on the same level as your local bank, be it Chase or whatever, same operating level, only the name is a foreign entity to the Federal Reserve. It's not a domestic financial institution, and it's recognized as being the country. The Where it's located is United States minor outlying islands, even though they're mailing things to York, Pennsylvania. So what does that mean? Well, uh, there's uh, some paperwork has, has to be completed, and, and that's done and re actually ready to mail now. Uh, and the name is going to have the same 
level of access to the Federal Reserve System is your local bank. That means e-transfers, phone transfers, QSIP searches. Uh, the only thing that we're not, uh, the name is not going to do is it's not going to be a currency custodian because in that capacity you you would grant the auditors from the, from the thrift uh, from the Fed to come in and audit your vault and count the currency. So, uh, besides, we're, you'd have to be a complete idiot to want to warehouse Federal Reserve notes because they're not worth anything, right? Let me ask you a question, David. Hmm. So let's say uh, Jim Jones uh, is uh, got a hearing coming up. He's being tried for... Uh, I don't know, bank robbery, whatever. How would he use this in, to deal with a court situation? I don't know because I have no experience, but this is my best guesstimate that it would behoove all of you, and I urge you to do this, is abandon all these other concepts of how to find a remedy in dealing with the government and try this. I know what I'm asking you to do, and for it to be successful, you're, you're going to have to own it. So try uh, what? Well, how, how do we try it? All right, all right. Okay, just wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost at the two-hour mark, David. Is that the end of the broadcast? Well, we can keep going. I would like to, uh, you know, get to how to use this. Well, I'd be there already if you wouldn't interrupt me. Oh, uh huh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have to start poking you in the ribs. Folks, you got to operate in the office that's given to you. Okay, so we're going to be all operating in the office of executor or executrix. Yes. So by doing that, all we have to do is add that, what, to our name or? Yes, that's what you do. It's just as simple as that. I see. You 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 add exactly what's on uh, our letter, our PDF file letter that we posted out there and put in the file sections of, of the county notary, highest office, and all Google group. Right, and I've been flashing uh, the link it, to it, it right along. Yeah, it's it's the uh, letter from the estate, the all capitalized name estate. Uh, by the executor office. It's not you doing that. You've got to get this in your mind. It's not you doing it. It's the office of executor or executrix doing this, mm -hmm. communicating to the office of the individual that sent you the paperwork, the abandoned paperwork. Not the individual of the office. Whenever you take, and, and experience has taught us this, when, whenever you take the position of defendant or respondent <laughs> uh, 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 to the uh, uh, individual occupying the office, you always lose, no, no matter what the subject is. You're always going to lose. You're already, always at a disadvantage. Step up to your true office and authority from the executive or executrix office. If you're called into court, you're already involved and you've got to show up tomorrow morning, you've got to put a new face on. Do not go in there and respond as a defendant because they're, they're trying to, the lawyers are trying to trick you into being the debtor when you're the creditor. And if the, if the judge is going to be able to yell at you, the barfly, he's not a judge. He's just an administrator of a barfly, private barfly proceeding. It's not even a constitutionally authorized court. None of them are. If he's going to succeed by yelling at you and threatening you, then don't do this. Okay, has anybody used this already? Is there um, someone is asking on the chat? No, nobody's been into court and confronted anybody with this concept. We have a couple, a few letters, instances we've responded to them, but this is what I'm. So 
uh, you would be the guinea pig, mm. but I'm not sending you out there amongst the wolves without any armor. Okay? I've been doing this a long time, folks. I don't know everything there is to know. I, cer I certainly never will. Okay? But I have this understanding that I've been gifted with of what works and what doesn't work. And and what I'm telling you is based on over 38 years of research and and experience and, and operating in their barfly courts and things. So, so you would sign a document as the you, office? You would, if you're already called into court, I, if it, you're already in the third day of the trial, you you go you appear that next day as executor or executrix and you make that known to the court. Don't tell your lawyer if you have one that you're gonna do this. Don't warn them. Do not warn anybody that you're going to do this. You just spring it on them. I'm telling you that when you confront that barfly up there on the bench that you are there as executor, executrix of the estate, and you're challenging his authority and the other lawyers there, authority to administer the estate, to provide the written authority for them to do that, they will retreat. They will run from you because they're dealing with the creditor. You're now in their mindset, you are God calling them into Judgment Day. 